All right, folks, happy Friday. Nick Slavic here. This is Ask a Painter Live. Um, this is a weekly live Facebook show where I use my over two decades as a craftsman and an entrepreneur to answer any of your questions. Uh, I am here with the Jason Paris, the Elon Musk of, of our industry and possibly other industries. <laughs> and uh, he, friend of the show, show favorite, when you mention Jason Paris is going to be on, uh, everybody gets very excited about it. So um, we're going to be doing fireside chat today. Uh, and basically, I have a whole list of thought experimenty kinds of things, and we are just going to let Jason kind of go wherever he wants to. So we always have the PDCA contractor question of the week. I'm going to see if I can't lighten this up a little bit. There we go. So we have the PDCA contractor question of the week. We're going to take care of that. Uh, thank you to the PDCA, the Painting and Decorating Contractors of America, for being such a good underwriter. Uh, we share a lot of the same core values. We have some of the same goals. I know Jason and I are both members. Um, and we're actually both uh, going to be speaking at the National Expo come March. So I'm going to be talking about my apprenticeship program. Uh, what are you going to be speaking about? Um, millennials and dabbing. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. No, millennial leadership. Oh, nice. Uh, building a millennial team that challenges the norms. Nice. Very nice. Okay. So I know that um, we're all looking forward to the Expo. Uh, it's been an interesting, you know, I think at the last Expo they had like 40% of the crowd is either new or never been to one or it's a different sort of thing happening there so uh, very excited to see how that goes um, <clears throat> my friend uh, Ronnie Carlos uh, from Brazil my my friend interpreter uh, painting instructor will also be there wow. he's coming so that's that. gonna be a fun thing uh, me and the PDCA are kind of uh, facilitating that to get him here he was so kind to have me down for a tour of Brazil so that's gonna be fun for him uh, actually that's oh yeah there's Ronnie right now uh, we'll see you soon Ronnie so okay uh, PDCA contractor question of the week is what are some things that contractors can do in January to ensure profitability throughout the year and there is nobody better to talk to than this guy so what's something these guys can do now to make sure they actually have money at the end of the year so I'd say the number one thing is um, make a commitment to raise your prices. That pretty, the, the top thing you could do right now is just make a commitment to raise your prices. But you know what they're going to say, I'll lose out on a lot of jobs, I'll get a bad reputation as a painter for the rich people. What, what do you have to say about that? Um, so the first one, I'll lose out on a lot of jobs, that's okay. Um, so we did, a, we did a, a math experiment in the Minnesota Painter Group, <coughs> we showed if you raise your prices 50% and you sell half of the amount of work, half of the jobs you used to sell, you'll still make more money. Yep. Like net. I mean total. Grow, like you're, you'll total gross more money and you'll do less jobs so you'll probably have less overhead. So what happens was is you, know, you, you went through the famous Jason Paris spreadsheet experiment where yeah. we sort of, we laid out a, uh, you laid out a, a scenario where you raise your price by X amount. Do you remember how much it yeah, was? Yeah, so you started, I think we started at uh, fifty dollars an hour. Yep. And bumped it to seventy. Mm -hmm. So a huge increase. Yep. So a very large increase. And we started out with the assumption that you sold fifty percent of your work mm -hmm. when you were charging fifty. So that means you close out fifty percent of all the estimates yep. you do as a job. And then we said even if it went all the way down to twenty five percent. So now instead of selling one out of every two, you're selling one out of every four. And uh, we did kind of industry average for margin. Mm -hmm. um, and then you of course accounted for the additional revenue that you were charging to show yep. additional profits. And we showed using math and Excel that even if you had this, so you have the same number of estimates, even if you sold half of what you used to sell, but you were charging that much more, you'd end up with a larger profit. A larger, not half the work, half the half the stuff, or even half yeah. the half the work, same money, half the work, more money. Yeah. So I'd say that would be the number one thing you could do. Um, and if anybody's interested, they can PM me or Nick, yep. and uh, we can share that little G sheet we put together. But mm -hmm. number one thing you could do is commit to raising your prices. It's 2019. Um, supply and demand are like the most fundamental thing of economics. And when somebody, like our mindset should always be, or our mindset should be, you should get the most that you can right now. Yes. Because 10 years ago, it was, what is the lowest price that the consumer can get? Yep. Right now, it's what is the highest price the contractor can get? Mm -hmm. um, Jokingly, in the office, I says jokingly. We'll, uh, one of our sales guys, you know, it's, the talk track is someone comes back and says, you know, what's the best you can do, right? Oh, we've yep, got yep. these bedrooms, you know, four bedrooms. It's you know, two thousand dollars. What's the best you can do? Yeah. And honestly, in the market right now, you, you're internally thinking, 
I could probably get someone to pay me twenty three hundred for yeah, this. Exactly. Right? We could pro- we could probably do better. <laughs> I could probably get I, I could probably go do two more bids and yep. get someone to pay me twenty three hundred dollars for this exact amount of work. Yeah. But I'm here right now. It's an honest bid. Let's get this done. Yeah. Right. And that's kind of if you reverse that, that's how the, the consumer used to approach it. Right. What's the best I can get? I bet if I get three more bids, I could get two hundred dollars off. But he seems honest. Let's get yeah. this done right now. I don't have to get three more bids. Um, yeah, commit to raising your price because it's a unique time in the industry. We talk about that all the time, about the imbalance that is here currently. We'll probably yes. stay a little bit, but it seems to be at its peak right now when you look at both the supply and the demand and the competency side of things. And so by when you talk about supply and demand, yeah. we know what you know what you're talking about because you're you're an economist. Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm a, I, have a, <laughs> I have a BS degree from yeah. the University of Minnesota, which yeah. is a good school, but yep. I have a a bachelor's but you have you you've had many hours of deep thoughts on this sort of thing okay. and when you talk about supply and demand with this right now what is the supply and what is the demand yeah so the so demand is about, high because yes. people well probably the biggest thing that's driving I said there's the biggest thing that's driving probably demand is that um, did I say supply was high I meant to say demand was high yep. demand is probably the highest because of consumer confidence so whether people have money or not, they're willing to part with it. Yes. And yes. that is probably one of the biggest drivers for residential repaint is consumer confidence. Um, so you have that, right? Booming economy, interest rates are still relatively low. So you mm-hmm. have a lot of transactions in the housing market. And yep. people are willing to part with their money on something that can At be- At a higher level than normal. Yes. It feels like right yep. now. Yeah, yeah, it's like, yes. It's not that much of a pain point to mm-hmm. paint your house. Mm-hmm. Um, on the supply side, you have a couple of different factors, right? We have, well, even just because there's so much building happening in commercial and industrial, mm-hmm. that's pulling some of the labor force away from residential repaint, which drops that supply. But then you also have, right, the classic baby boomers are retiring at yep. X thousand people a day. Mm-hmm. Um, you have people not entering the trades. Um, and then you just have, you have like this consistently low mark of competency that's starting to be shown because there's a slightly higher bar. Yes. So like. If you look at true supply of competent painters, like everyone used to be somewhat competent because there wasn't a higher bar. Yes. But it seems like now there's starting to be some stratification of you have the standard mm-hmm. and now you have like the new standard. The new standard is like call people back, do what you say you're gonna do. Um, like don't be an alcoholic and don't you know smoke on the job site. Yeah. Um, that's kind of like the new standard. So it's almost like what was a generic like aggregate supply has now been stratified. Yep. And so well, now there's options. Yeah, there's options and it's, exactly. Yep, so that's that's like a ranting thing on supply and demand. So, and, and what's interesting, it's not like, oh, well, people are willing to part with their money. It's that plus 18% of all the trades right now are made out of baby boomers and they're leaving. Mm-hmm. Uh, our industry is growing. The demand for our industry is growing. There's less and less people into the trades right now. You, I mean, I think you could say, Honestly, there's there's Gen X and Millennials. There are less percentage of those are getting into trades jobs than before. So not only is the demand going up, there's less and less of us. So it's almost this dual effect of that. That's why I think we always talk about the unique position in, in time right now in the economy. It's not just because people are willing to spend more money. It's because it's going like this, too. Mm-hmm. And that's what's making it even more apparent, I think, that this is a unique time. Yeah. When you have – and it's just like it's the classic supply, demand – chart right you mm-hmm. have your demand your supply you raise prices yep <laughs> that's yep. what you do yep. right so you should be in this scenario this is like it's like very classic like whoa what should we do should we yep. like you raise your prices in this economic scenario yep. like that is the rational thing to do yep so that would be if you're looking what can i do to make sure 2019 is good raise your prices and on, on its simplest form uh, another example of this is i'm a single painter i book up a year and a half of in, in advance yeah. so you could hold that as a hallmark, or you could say, are you providing a poor customer service for those people who have to wait a year and a half? Should you raise your prices to get it to a level where you only have four to six weeks of lead time mm-hmm. and, and keep those people happy? You'd be making more money, you'd be yeah. getting those people happy, and they're gonna get their house painted. And so that, that at its simplest form, that that's probably another version of that, yes? Yeah, yeah, you should. It's almost a disservice to people who are willing yes. to pay a premium to yeah. have you paint their house in a reasonable timeline. Yep. Um, yeah, so. wonderful. Okay, so um, so you mentioned um, just raise your price, um, and I think uh, you know industry average. I think we usually talk about fifty or fifty-five dollars an hour of revenue generation. 
yeah. uh, something like that. That seems to be what a lot of companies use as sort of a standard for judging a project of, of you know, was it a good project or a bad project as the over under. So um, anything else somebody can do right now uh, to ensure yeah. profitability? So, and again, these are, so the second thing, I, they're both commitments. The second yes. thing would be um, commit to an annual budget with for, per category. So say I'm gonna spend uh, this much in this category, this much in this category, and you can allow uh, like clause triggers of why you would adjust it, mm -hmm. but make the commitment to your budget. So budget is tough, uh, especially for people who maybe haven't collected data over the years, um, maybe haven't had a lot of years to collect data. Um, how, do, how are you supposed to make an educated guess mm -hmm. on what a budget is? Yeah, that's a great question. So this comes, so like how do you set a goal without much experience? Right. without knowing what to expect sometimes. Yeah, so I think it's hard. I think you make an estimated guess and then you refine it as you go. Mm -hmm. So this just reminds me of like priority management and like just general bi business goal setting. Uh, yep. And budget, like, so like in budgeting would be another thing. So like in priority management, you lay out your tasks for the quarter, for the week, for the year, and you assign times, how much time it will take, mm -hmm. you know, based off of your experience. And if you've never done that task before, it's hard to know. If you've done that task you know 15 times that you can very much dial it in and you'll be mm -hmm. very effective so that's just that is a hard thing if you don't have the information the data you're gonna have to comb through and find data points mm -hmm. to reference but um, in that case I'd give yourself a little bit more flexibility to say I'm learning yep. and you know I'm gonna budget you know X dollars for snacks right but I've never ran a business before and I don't know how many <laughs> snacks I'll need. Or just whatever it is, right? Or water bottles, so right? If everybody eats one bag of cheese it's a day, use that as a starting yeah. point, you know? You know what I would do is I would set a budget for Q1 yeah. and say, and I'm going to commit to reviewing and setting a, using the, so you're going to commit to two things. One, collecting data mm -hmm. so that you oh, know what the results yes, are. Baseline. And then reviewing that data and making a new decision. Yep. And saying, Q, so that's, yeah, that's, that, that's probably the best advice I'd give is set a budget for Q1, collect your information, and commit to using that information to set a more honed in and dialed in budget for Q2 yep. that you commit to. So yeah, I would, I would echo that the whole data collection thing is one piece of data is better than no data. And if you have not collected data, because here's the situation most, most guys are in. I'm a painter, I've been a painter for five years, Everything's on paper. I don't really know how long something's gonna take me. I don't really know how much I'm spending in marketing, but you have spent something in marketing. Mm -hmm. And you know, even even you can make a good educated guess. Most people starting on January first of twenty nineteen did not are not brand new to painting or painting business. You have done this before. So you at least should, you know. Yeah. Be when you able... say that so you said that and then you also said about the guy who likes to book out a year in advance. Yes. And like why do you hold that as a hallmark? Some of it is somewhat bragging rights, but I think part of it is the anxiety of having to go sell. And I think you do have to make a decision, like, do you want to run a business or not? Yes. Right? So if you don't want to run a business, then fine. You know, be one person, book out a year, a two years in advance. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not raising your prices. You're, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. No, not at all. Um, same thing, like, you know, if you, you don't want to run a business. You just want to see what happens, right? Spend money as you need to. Yep. Um, that's fine. But if you want to run a business, you have to make a commitment. And it's going to be, that's part of it is I'm going to commit to tracking my numbers. Yep. I'm going to commit to recording the data because I'm going to use that to make better decisions because I am going to be a business. This is going to be a business. Yep. And that's, man, you we've wanna, got. Because you, you want to, well, yeah, we're still haven't even started there's the some questions great, yet. <laughs> well, there's some great topics around that right, as we get into it about yeah. stratification and what's coming up. So it's, it's really interesting about the whole mindset thing because, you know, I, I grew up in a family business where it was like, you're a painter, and as long as your house isn't foreclosed on, you are a successful painter. Mm -hmm. And as long as your kids have clothes and food and all that, but there was never any measuring. Uh, I think there are people who have this natural tendency for constant improvement and for if I'm going to spend an hour doing something, I'm going to do it, get a baseline, mm -hmm. make a correction, get more out of that hour, mm -hmm. and then get more. I think some people are probably more naturally mm -hmm. uh, you know, motivated to do something like that, but you make a really good point. It's something that I really haven't heard articulated before, um, at least to me, which is if you do actually want to have a business, you need to measure things. You need to make corrections on those things, and you, for your own sake and for your client's sake, you should try to maximize what you do. 
because time is a constant. You know, we all have the same amount of time, and it's how much value you can sort of derive from your efforts, you know, units of energy put into it um, for your own family, for yourself, and then for your clients. You know? Capitalism is a beautiful thing. Yeah. Right? It's kind of the basics of capitalism. Yeah. What kind of value? And it's then there's many, there's a lot of paradigms that we're talking through. One is growth mindset, mm-hmm. right, versus a fixed mindset. Another would be uh, value creation versus uh, scarcity mindset. And uh, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let's let's see what uh, Russ. Aim high while figuring out your numbers. Too easy to lose money on a project. Yep, I I do agree. I'd say, especially in this economy, especially I would in this say market. if you're and, and the interesting thing is is uh, you know I keep finding, like when I have a decision to make, it's like if you're ever gonna make this decision now would be a good time to do it because it's never going to be an easier time if yeah. this if this experiment isn't exactly what you thought it was going to be way easier to recover from that experiment now yeah. than in 2009 and a half you know <laughs> yeah. so okay um we have a whole list of sort of thought experimenty type of things this is jason's pick uh whatever he wants to talk Ooh. about so right. um I'll, I'll just say a few things while jason's looking at the list Thank you guys uh, for watching this. Dave Scaturo, uh, thanks for watching as well. A uh, friend of the show, a uh, friend in the industry. Uh, the kindest thing you can do for this show is share it. Jason's going to uh, go right down the list, pick whatever he wants to talk about, and uh, we're going to get to it. And uh, comments and questions down below too, guys. We'd love your feedback. Okay. What let's, interests you? Let's talk about, gosh, well, let's talk about technology and the trades. Yes. We'll start there and then we'll go. I've got another one picked up. Absolutely. So, um, do you feel we're at a time where it's changing? Yes. <laughs> yes. And you laugh because we look around your office. Okay. And, and this is a, so when you say te- technology in the trades, I think some people get a little um, skeptical mm-hmm. about how much technology can actually inject itself into the trades. Mm-hmm. And I think instead of technology, we should use the phrase tool. Tool. Right? Yeah. Technology is better. So like these computers that we have. So it's almost a heading tool, and under that heading is technology, yeah. or sprayer, yep. or van. Yeah, yeah. You field tools, uh, mobility tools, and operational or administrative tools. Um, but yes, I. Man, we were. It's it's. It feels so wild. Like, not. It feels like we're in a time of change right now, and I would say maybe in the past two years. Yes. And I have. I've, I've not been around that long, but. Um, I don't think 10 years ago people were saying like, gosh, things are changing crazy. Uh, maybe they were, but you know, outside of the paint sprayer or the paint roller, right? That was a tool that disrupted the market. Yep. Paint sprayer was a tool that disrupted the market. The technology has been changing the last 10 years, but I think the biggest disruptor, there's the two biggest disruptors are the adoption of technology and consumer preference. So the technology in a very rudimentary form has existed. Some way yes. in the past ten years, yep. but to what extent has it been adopted by the business owner? And by and, and what you're talking about is basically the admin function, right? The 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 desktops, so, the laptops, the tablets, the cell phones. Yeah, so your like business, that. yeah, your business operates very differently if you are handwriting bids versus doing them in some kind of a CRM cloud-based yep. format. Mm-hmm. Um, and how is it different? It dif- it's different in the delivery. It's different in the field. It's different in how smart you can be. Yep. Um, so like sneak sneak attack like this is this, this is a secret yep. but like are you sending proposals that have pictures based off the demographic that you're bidding to yep. right so are you if you have an elderly couple are you prepping that before and you're giving them elderly couple references and yep. pictures and smiling pictures um are you in a very like northeast minneapolis minneapolis hipster neighborhood yep and you've done your demographics you know you're going to go bidding with two 30 year olds right yep. so you've yep. got so like you can just be a lot smarter and a lot sneakier digitally um, so those are real differences. Now, business owners have not adopted that very well. I mean, large businesses haven't adopted it well until recently because they've been forced to. Um, but trades-based companies are the worst. Like, they have not adopted it very low levels, and that's where you're starting to see a little bit of stratification. The second piece is consumer preference, right? Consumer preference is starting to change where they actually value those things, and they demand it. Yep. And the fact that you provide videos and follow-ups and I uh, have instant communication. You know, it's just it's valued a lot differently. When paper may have been, um, may have done the job just as well yeah. a decade ago. And I know that from the feel in a business, even three to five years ago, it was tough. Even just I love to do all my communication by email. 
I think you probably do too in some form. So three to five years ago, you couldn't get 100% compliance from your clients. Some people didn't have email, some people didn't prefer email, whatever else. Now that has completely changed and through all the age brackets and everything else yeah. and consumer preference, now before what was, what was a, a stealthy app where there was a couple things that, that helped the client out very well, it was easy to navigate and intuitive, now, when you see a painting company's or a roofing company's website that basically has a, a button that says free quote and you hit it, mm -hmm. I, I think people are not, they're not skeptical of that anymore. Mm -hmm. I think they, they know that they'll actually be contacted. And in, in some ways, if this is what you're getting at, I think they almost prefer that now. Yeah. You know, yeah. as to the old going through the yellow pages, finding a yeah. phone number, leaving a voice message, and who knows when they're going to call you back. Exactly. So I think technology is changing, but probably the two biggest disruptors are um, tech adoption mm -hmm. and consumer preference. So, so you're basically saying the internet has been here for a while, Wi-Fi has been here for a while, but now paint companies are starting to use it. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> like smartphones. Like but yeah, exactly. Like there's a lot of there's a lot of old technology that we're using in our industry uh -huh. that's still cutting edge. Yeah, and right? now when my feeling, and that when I talk to other people, is that, you know went to a speaking engagement down in Missouri and I'm showing people how I basically Googleized my business over the last year and everything is digital and all that stuff. And I keep coming back to this is not groundbreaking or novel. Like this is what real businesses do. Yeah. Am I correct in that? I mean like when you go out into the world of Fortune 500, I mean is is the digitization, is it the the ease of use, the electronic communication. I just assume that's what's happening around me. Mm -hmm. I guess I could be, I mean, depending on the size of business, but I don't know, what are your, what Depends are your thoughts? on the industry too. Like, yeah. we've all interfaced with entities that are just amazingly archaic. Yep. And you're like, how does this exist? You're like, oh wait, the DMV is not a privatized entity. Mm -hmm. So, um, there's a lot, yeah. But again, there's a lot of, it's old technology that is groundbreaking, that is cutting edge for mm -hmm. us, but, um, Outside of like, there's not too many painting companies, there's not hardly any small businesses that are like revolutionary, like fully utilizing new tech as it emerges. So there's way less adoption in these sort of trades than there is in the standard world. Yeah, but which, and the trades are ripe for a renaissance. Absolutely. Right? They're, they're probably going to go through it. They probably have been for a little bit. They might be right and, now. And um, you look at the you know, industries get shaken up, they get disrupted, they get and it's nobody cares 20 years from now it's just yep. who's left standing what i mean no one it's just it's it's capitalism yep. and, it's and, and by happens. disruption i've heard you talk about you know 20 years ago if you wanted a cup of coffee you went to a diner and every yep. diner was a mom and pop and every diner was its own thing <coughs> non-standardized product different hours different locations and now starbucks and caribou yeah 20 years later yeah, very standardized products, you know, some good things, but that, I mean, there's lots of industries that get consolidated, and it's, again, it's kind of like capital, it's just what happens with capital, yep. right? You, um, If the product is better, it's easier to get, and it's predictable, consumer preference, yes, is that what drives that sort of thing? Yeah, consumer preference and just efficiency, yes. effectiveness. Yeah. There are probably some industries that deal with better economies of scale wise. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's a specific reason why painting wouldn't in that case, but um, I don't know. It's an, it's an interesting thing to think through, right? Because there are franchises in painting mm -hmm. and uh, they do a lot of revenue nationally. Yes. But yep. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if but, I've ever seen a painting franchise where I've been like, impressed. And uh, is it is it is the feeling I get going off no data is the feeling I get that they have processes they have systems they're utilizing uh, technology at a higher rate yeah. something between that the management function the admin function and actual in somebody's house something happens there less than less than optimal okay yes so I'd say there's a couple of things um, and these are just fireside chat thoughts fireside chat um, open and honest the first would probably be. Um, franchises have something which is better than nothing and at the current state of the trades um, that's they win a lot and they should win because they're actually raising the bar mm -hmm. now I don't know this might I know there are people I franchises are great and there's 
We have friends in I, who do franchise stuff too. I have not been impressed by any of them though, and I would tell yeah. them that to their face. Yeah. Um, I would say that their bar is significantly lower than a competent person who is actually passionate and is a good leader. Mm -hmm. So most, it's mean, but I don't think most franchisees are great leaders, are passionate. Certainly, they don't have a good risk profile for growth mindset. And the fact that, so again, this is harsh, but it's like, yeah. if you are gonna buy into a painting franchise, how risk averse could you possibly be? <laughs> I suppose, yeah. Um, and if like... you're that risk averse, how willing are you to uh, be growth mindset out of anything that your conglomerate tells you is cutting edge? Yep. Now, don't get me wrong, what the franchises offer are oftentimes very much above yes. the current conglomerate, but it, not saddens me, but just depresses me sometimes um, because I know the bar should be here. And, I, and, and yep. we have a cohort of pain, and especially like you look into a group like the PCA, <laughs> yeah. and I think there are even some franchises in there, so yes. um, I still want to be your friend. Yeah. But it's just calling a spade a spade. Um, it's just there's a it j the, the system does not translate directly to execution unless yeah, there's on, a leader and an integrator to cause do Because on, on paper, you would think, oh, why isn't the entire painting industry made up of franchises? Good question, yeah. You would yeah. be like, on, on paper, it makes the most sense that a Starbucks yeah. of painting why, would come along and yeah. just take that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to put it, right? So you look in the Twin Cities, right? There are, what is it, Serta Pro? Wow, Jer one day. Wow, one day. Uh, College Pro. College Pro. What's that one? Protect, Five Star. Mm -hmm. um, why aren't they dominating the market yeah. when they actually have a system and everybody else is a chuck in a truck? Yeah. I don't think they're that much better than a chuck in a truck, honestly, a lot of times. Um, do you th think they're better at marketing? Oh, you no, know, absolutely which is good, they but are. Yeah. It's, and um, there, there are a lot of really smart people who think a lot about this and have a lot of capital and money riding on it. So um, I could very much be speaking out of turn and just not have the proper perspective on yeah. this. But. Um, the reason why is because they lack, I don't know, I don't want to say because it it's so mean, but they lack leadership and execution and passion. So the like you were saying, the average personality profile of somebody who would get into there is probably more like a maybe mid-level manager or a standard manager than so a entrepreneurial it's sort It's a of stereotype and it's, it's true for a reason. And I've met several of them. Yeah. If you're gonna buy into a painting franchise, you're usually a mid-level corporate burnout. He has been sold on the repeatability mm -hmm. of residential repaint. Yep, yep. And uh, a lot of them do fairly well. I don't. I think if you really look at the attrition rates, they're relatively high. Yeah. Um, but I don't know how we got on like a huge franchise bashing tangent. No, I tell you what. Why just, don't just yeah. we were talking about technology? You cleanse your palate. If there's something else you want to talk about technology, I'm going to see if we got a question here. Oh, Katie Hakes. Uh, this much facial hair cannot exist on one Ask a Painter beard stash overload. <laughs> I know that uh, I think Torlando, Katie's husband, is actually down at the PDCA. Just did a, uh, a podcast with Chris Shank too, so nice. I'll be I'll be curious to see. I, I love hearing uh, uh, Torlando's thoughts. So, um, Russ, I scheduled a job interview yesterday, or I scheduled a job yesterday, and the customer was amazed that I could schedule work, process her deposit, sign contracts, and send her a receipt without even breaking a pen out. Yeah. And you're like, that's not that impressive. Whoever said that, who was it? Russ, and Russ is like, um, like it's 2019, like, but uh, but people are impressed. So it's just, yes. it's that phrase, it's old technology that's cutting edge. Yes, and if you yeah, can, oh, yeah. Like the fact, <laughs> like, so like electronic payments have been around for a long time. Our good friend Elon Musk, right, PayPal, Our actually X.com. Friend, X. Com, friend of the then, show, yep. Yep, but then partnered with eBay and, and yeah. X, yep, so. Um, <laughs> That was a long time ago. A long time ago. <laughs> that it really kind of broke into the mainstream. Yeah. And uh, I would agree, and especially, and I think it's consumer preference thing. Like people are, they're appreciative of it for us and they like it. And we've had the same experience where we're like, wow, I wish my plumber was like this. And then we're like, hmm, how do we, Yeah. we've got our dream board up there. Yeah. How do we yeah. dominate the trades? Paris plumbing. Paris <laughs> 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 alliteration. So what, what's interesting too is that um, in, I had this intentional thought, and like your dream board, we follow a similar sort of VTO, Vision Traction organize, Organizer. One of my goals for 2018 was virtual estimates. Yeah. Like this whole novel thing of, 
I look at my year and I spend seven hours a day in people's houses giving free estimates. Yeah. Can I not do seven hours a day? So like, why can't you just have them send you pictures? Why? And, and my immediate thought was always, why can't we Skype in? And immediately it was like, why can't you just have them send pictures? Like, I don't need yeah. to do this capability. And honestly, I think maybe 40% of my estimates last year were done. Somebody clicks on my website, submits an easy form, I get back to them immediately, they send pictures, I send them an estimate, and I'm never surprised by the job. And that's been like a life changer. And I thought it was like this novel idea. Turns out it was like, that's what they kind of want. Like you, you can go online to a t-shirt company and get a virtual <laughs> estimate. You just type in the size, the number, the color, and that's you get a, yeah. Great point. They don't say, oh, can you come to the store and we'll talk about it. For I'd like to try bit. that shirt on before I do it. Like, yeah. no, you're, the ease of that process, you're taking a risk that large is a large. And if the website does not make any mistrust with you, if there's nothing you see that's like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so I don't know. That's been a that's been an interesting thing. But sending pictures to somebody is not. It's it's a new use of a super old yeah. technology, and people are just like, oh. And it, and it's uh, I think you and I probably run into the same thing where it's like we're almost disappointed when people like that stuff because that lets you know how low the standard is in our trade. Yeah. You know, it should be higher. This yeah. should be the standard. We should be now upping this game of one-click estimates and, and all yeah, this other stuff. A, so. Yeah, it's such a bizarre thing to be like, where you're unimpressed, but you're still like the market leader, right? You're <laughs> it's still very like, interesting. And you're just like, hmm. So somebody asked me at the St. Louis thing when I gave a, a master's class on sort of the you know this virtual estimating process and they're like well why do you print it why do you print out the estimate in their driveway and bring it in and it's like it's almost just like like I don't know, force majeure like it's it's almost just an impressive thing to show up and to have the ability to do that I don't know that the paper estimate adds anything more than if I, I just emailed it yeah. but uh, yeah it's but it's preferences even Midwest because there are West Coast guys that are all digital oh yeah I mean yep. uh, if you could talk to some of the Seattle painting companies mm -hmm. where it's like Tech, tech haven. Yes. Yeah. And uh, and the things that they do with their estimates are like, I mean, they're different level for yep. sure. Like they yep. actually are sophisticated. Yes. Probably more closer to actual cutting edge. Yes. Some of the companies out there. Um, but yeah, you were talking. So what you were talking about was kind of interesting. One was like again the disruption of consumer preference, mm -hmm. right? The other was using first principle reasoning and saying, yes. do I need to do this? Why am I doing this? Um, what would be the consequence if I were to change that? Here's what I think, let's try it. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a very valuable exercise to go through. We should always be challenging our business model. And we should always be willing to run an experiment yep. that we can afford the cost to run. Yep. Right. So there's some experience that you actually cannot afford to run. I was thinking about this because I was, <laughs> when I did the um, the price the pricing game yes. at the Minnesota Painter Group, I was like, this isn't, this is a, you should at least run a test, right? Now, to be fair, in the dead of winter, if you're a new company, small company, you can't afford a test, right? Very good point. You're going to lose your people if you run a test and it doesn't work. You need to keep the lights on. Yep. But, you know, for any medium-sized company or especially in the summer, you know, if you have 20 estimates in a week, take, well, take all 20 and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise the price 50%. Mm -hmm. My hypothesis is I will sell half of the work that I typically do. Yep. But I will net a higher margin mm -hmm. and uh, again, and, and no perfect experiment so whatever happens with your with your 20 estimates you can't say okay now I know for certain this yeah. is gonna happen but data well that's how the scientific model works absolutely so the scientific model is you can never prove anything yep. you can only disprove uh, antagonistic hypotheses and you can sort of keep you can keep reinforcing what's already yeah. been done before yeah. so like throughout the history of time gravity would say that if I've dropped this, it, if I yeah. if I let go, my hands reduce the friction of this this cup or this bottle, it will yeah. head in a downward velocity. Yep. I think that will happen. I'm gonna run an experiment and it does, right? I cannot prove, I have not proved that that will happen tomorrow. Yep. Right? You can never prove that this will continue. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like a basic scientific, uh, mm -hmm. the scientific, what is it called? Process. Process, yeah. Yep. So Middle school. Technology, yes. So technology. Uh, anything else you want to cover? I know you guys uh, deal heavily in technology. Anything else like that the, we're missing out? So you, so your Elon's neural link. Uh, yes, yes. Link. So, um, which is interesting, and I'll say this too: that we're we're talking about like technology. So we have 
we have the, the application tools, which are our technology. I mean, most painters, the first bit of technology they get is a sprayer, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. Now we have a cell phone. Now can we use a cell phone for business? Now can we use a laptop with 17 monitors? Can we, can we somehow use technology like that? But then there's this also sort of like, it, it wouldn't be called augmented reality. It would be called like, well, when we use a Bluetooth earpiece. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's taking a piece of technology Cyborg. and yeah. doing, yeah, we're basically creating cyborgs. And Elon Musk, maybe you can describe the neural link better than I can. You probably had way deeper thoughts on it. Elon and I were talking every day about this. Quick call. Yeah. Quick call. Neural link. Yep, yep. So uh, <laughs> the basic kind of concept is we are all cyborgs, right, with mm -hmm. technology, right? We are you all. You have glasses. Yep. Yeah, exactly. That's a great question. Uh, or a great, great um, point to make, right? We all use technology. Um, we even, and, and to kind of make that stratification, even digital technology, yep. right? We're all, and this is a common concept, right? We are all telepathic, yep. right, with our phones. I can, I can send a message to my wife right now, and she will instantly know what I'm thinking about mm -hmm. through, the, through the use of text messaging. Um, so we all have this ability, but the interface is very rudimentary, right? If I want to input something, it's usually through my digits, um, sometimes through my voice, but if mm -hmm. I want to interface with my computer, I want to put information. The interface for me to in enter information to the computer is usually through my digits, and um, that's a kind of a slow process. Mm -hmm. um, the interface for me to receive information in is through my visual and auditory, and that has a decent bandwidth, but it's still pretty limited. Um, and so Elon's Neuralink, which is a company he's founded, one of the kind of three main endeavors that are interesting right now, in my opinion, is about um, reducing the friction between that interface, between mm -hmm. uh, technology and the human. And um, it's very, very interesting, right? So the interface becomes smaller and smaller to where it's almost nil, mm -hmm. and you are now part of the technology, you are the technology. So right now, like, I am the technology, I control this phone, but what if this phone was, if what if the interface was not how fast my thumbs could move, it was more of my cognitive ability to think. Yeah. What if the interface in was not how fast my mind could take information in, it was just directly into my cognitive mind. Mm -hmm. And again, he would argue that this is, and I love, so I love Elon Musk, you know that yep. about me. That's why you call me all these affectionate words. Yep. yep. Um, right, so obviously AI is a thing, mm -hmm. and this is a painting show, so we don't have to get into it, but. This is um, what we're here for, Jason. <laughs> if you were to think long term about AI, and you know, how do you maximize the likelihood that consciousness will maintain in the mm -hmm. universe, which is kind of one of his main MOs. Um, you would like us not to be eradicated by AI. Yes. Right? And there are a lot of reasons, a lot of scenarios where we do get eradicated by AI, where consciousness does. Mm -hmm. um, unless you become the AI and, and they're symbiotic, right? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the only scenario where you win. Um, it's kind of like the only chess players that beat AI are when they are AI assisted. So oh, a human sure. will not beat an AI in uh, most games. And painting is a game. Right, so mm -hmm. if you take a game, AI will most likely beat you. Yep. And I don't care if it's, what's that game? Ah, uh, you guys are gonna. The people who know us will be very upset. <laughs> but there's a game that people thought an AI would never be able to beat a human in, and it recently did. Oh. Was it Go okay. or something? Huh. Um, but obviously, like you've got chess, you've got that, um, you've got you know, then you extrapolate to the stock market. Yep. You've got business. Um, it's all a game. There's lots of lots of games that you can play. And what is the optimal strategy, and how is it taken? What is the optimal strategy given the conditions that you face? Yep. And what is your goal? Mm -hmm. right? And is consciousness um, a necessary end result for, to achieve your goal? Mm -hmm. However, um, at least in chess, and this was true at one point, I don't know if it is still true, but the only time an AI could be beat was through a conscious assisted AI. So you had a human oh, okay. um, taking in the creativity of the human mind, mm -hmm. um, being assisted with AI. That's the only time that you could beat an AI. And so that's kind of his, I think, his long play, right? So, so he's not envisioning the robot wars where it's, it's flesh versus that. He's like, well, not, what, if, what if we take what's good about us and good about them and sort of yeah. a little bit of it's both? It's probably inevitable. We have, if, so and there are several yeah. outcomes, right? Yep. So either <laughs> AI does not come to fruition because of World War III yep. or yep. other disruptors that are not conducive to the well-being of mm -hmm. the planet. Um, or we get extincted mm -hmm. by AI. I think there are too many scenarios where that happens. Mm -hmm. Or we become a symbiotic AI consciousness interface that um, preserves our 
I don't know, consciousness seems like a very special thing. And so for him, it's really important that we preserve it. And it and seems that's like whole... it still has a lot of value, too. It's not this It's not this remnant of a past that doesn't have much value. I mean, you could argue that AI is a product of that, you know? So yeah. it's like it doesn't have any value or it doesn't have no value. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's kind of his whole thing. And that's when I mean, you talked about. So Neuralink, it's just, it's just the idea that... Um, Technology goes fast, it goes slow, mm -hmm. it gets adopted fast, it gets adopted slow, but business is a game, and the tools that you play, the tools that you use in that game determines your chance of winning, your ability to win yeah. and beat others. And uh, those that adopt tools right now are winning a lot um, and are adopting optimal strategy. Yep. Right? So an optimal strategy is calling your client back. That's a winning strategy right now. Sadly, in our, in our industry, um, yes. <laughs> an optimal strategy, there's a lot of good optimal strategies. There's also a lot of good tech utilization of tools and technology. Um, well, and the interesting thing is when you, I mean, you're down the path already of AI and neural link and, and seven monitor setups. When really, when you read the data on our industry, 70% of all painters don't have a website. So right now, I don't think it'll be that way in 10 years. <laughs> no. Right? I, and I but, think, I think both of us are in agreement with that, that and now the teeter totter flips. Yeah. And it's partially like, it's partially Nick Slavic. Right, but it's a partially just the spirit of, uh, it's, it's Nick Slavic, Ask a Painter, it's PDCA, right? It's Paint Ad Podcast. Well, a lot of it is people just being connected and finding. I mean, three years ago, I was opened up in the world of social media. That's how I met you. That's yeah. how I met the PDCA, and and you got a peek into what yeah. other people it's are doing. It's just interesting that those who are, uh, like painting, just seems like an interesting trade, and I think more are going to follow suit. But where. Those that who are adopting technology that have adopted optimal strategies are willing to flood the marketplace with that as opposed to being um, like isolated. And, uh, oh, so you're, you're saying those who would adopt this technology, these avenues of getting technology to your clients are more apt to then do a whole bunch of it than still be the chuck in a truck. Yeah, do a whole bunch of it, but also propagate the information to their peers. Oh, so also... Yeah, infect yeah. other people. Yeah, and uh, it's just I don't see the market staying the way it was. So right now it already feels different than it was three years ago. I would agree. Um, I don't see it. St in 10 years, I expect it to be very different. And it's where, like, gosh, is this, like, a really, really special time right now where uh, you can just win, win, win? What will it look like in 10 years? And uh, then you've got the whole idea of what is the actual rate of change possibility. Mm -hmm. So, again, like, Elon is a good friend of the show. We like him a lot. Yep. He talks about, so electronic vehicles seem like a great thing. Uh, seem like a very, really good deal. However, it was, it was like even if every single plant in the world that produces cars <laughs> stopped today and, and, and just it was already retrofitted, right? Yep. Yep. It was able to produce only electric vehicles at the same output. Yep. It would take like 10 years <laughs> to... To, to make that many. Replace it. Right, so even when something is amazing, even when it's an industry disruptor, there's still something called the rate of change. Yes, potential. yeah, yeah. And uh, it's kind of like if I were to pour this water out, it feels full. Like if you, had a, if you had a gallon jug, right, and you dump it over, it's like, boom, like the, the water's just gushing. It's still going to take time for it to get all the way yeah. empty. And it's during that period of time that you'd say, this is your business existing in a rate of change, in a time that is a high rate of change. Yeah, yeah. And, and once that time is over, it will be different. The water will no longer be in the jug. It'll be here. There won't be this big spout happening, but for a period of time, there is a stream of water coming from that jug going into the sink, yep. and uh, it's not instantaneous. Maybe that's the biggest thing I'm trying to verbalize is yep, yep. this change is never instantaneous. It's not it's a light switch. It's almost amazing when it's, you are literally dumping a jug upside down, jug upside down and gravity is having its way with the mm -hmm. water. You'd think... But it just takes time. It does. Even and again, it was with, with electronic vehicles. Even if it was, even if just you know their new battery technology became a no-brainer, it would still take ten years to actually produce mm -hmm. it. I like that. Okay. And a, a a perfect example is in one year I went from you know paper stuff and you know a uh, landline and phone calls and in-house visits to basically an all digital company where. My father still runs a painting business, doesn't own a cell phone or a computer. Hmm. Not like I have one and I, oh, those stupid yeah. cell phones, doesn't own one and has yeah. no interest in owning one. So yeah. through attrition, there's going to be some of that stuff too. So 
interested. Let me burn through a few questions here, and then we'll. Why don't you see I something? Got you Good, good, good. Russ Perry, I think you're right though. There, there are uh, they are more surprised as it's being done by tradespeople talking about the estimates. Uh, Christian, oh, our good friend Christian, of the 40%, you get pictures for estimates. How many did you close? Uh, my close ratio is at or above um, what my in-house sort of general, somebody calls, leave a voicemail, I show up at their house and do an estimate. Um, I've set up like two or three hurdles so that by the time somebody gets Smart. to that point, They've already found my website. They've already done one or two tiny little things, clicked on something interesting, given me one piece of information where all the people who are just window shopping or something else didn't see the time to fill out the form. They're like, ah, yeah. oh, screw it. I Smart. can't just, yeah. So it's it's just like I find my apprentices too. You ask for two tiny little hurdles for them to step over and they self-select instead of instead of not self-select. So Russ Perry, da, 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 da. Uh, let's see, Connor, oh, friend, Connor, uh, love picture estimates, uh, the more we all use it, the more it will become the standard, lots of video pictures help gain the trust of customer, uh, may have been gained in by a personal estimate, and yes, that was a, this is the first thing, and I know we've talked to a lot of, you know, the, the one person painters, they're like, I'm so nervous about hiring my first employee, I'm so nervous about not being in somebody's house for an estimate, mm -hmm. through experiments, you find that you, if, if you've done all the right things you should, you can gain just as much trust by having a super efficient, quick, tight transaction yeah. virtually as you can, I'll be here nine days from now and we'll see you at 3.30 and then yeah. you drive and out, you know, you know what I'm saying, so. Yeah. I love the thought of, yeah, you're breaking it down, basically saying what is the value of an in-person estimate, mm -hmm. truly, outside of tradition. Yep, outside of tradition. And before, I used to think, well, you know, we hold ourselves in high esteem, and you think nobody's going to sell this better for me than yeah. me. And you, and you think a lot of the time, well, listen, based on our industry, I have a better chance if you can physically see me talk, yeah. I will probably have a better chance of gaining your trust. And it turns out that trust can be replicated with a near instantaneous transaction. That that the 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 quickness of that almost builds as much trust as you standing in their house. So, I don't know, it's interesting. <laughs> Christian, I am beginning to feel we can't say it's just paint anymore. <laughs> At least not for this guy. Um, uh, Patrick, thanks for watching. Uh, Melbourne. Oh, Peter, uh, Peter said Florida? he was gonna. It's in Florida? No, yeah, uh -huh. Australia, so. <laughs> Oh, what you're excited Florida? about <laughs> somebody watching from Florida. No, uh, Peter, uh, Peter, yeah, you. Uh, he said he was going to watch, uh, I don't know, it's probably four days in the future in the middle of the night, right, in Australia? <laughs> I don't know how he's standing upside down. I know, it's like he's got to hold his phone upside down. Yeah, so. All right, so back to thought experiment list. Okay. Uh, what else interests you, Jason? Uh, <laughs> what's that, like uh, novel business models, right? So, ah, what you yes. said it was really interesting. God, I think 45 uh, minutes already? So we got, okay. Okay. Um, I think that is a good one, though. What else yeah. would be an interesting thing? Well, whatever you pick is going to be interesting. So, novel, yeah. So, novel business models, like you said, it's uh, what is tradition and what is the value of that tradition? Mm -hmm. And sometimes, I, I, I was talking to Chris Shank the other day on a podcast, it's like, you should challenge everything and, and just prove it to yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And so, it's like, why do I wear shoes? Why don't I just walk outside in bare feet? Mm -hmm. What is this tradition? And it's like, well... My feet would get really cold because it's winter and I don't like discomfort. So I'm gonna continue wearing shoes. It's like, okay, good. I went through that thought process, mm -hmm. right? I at least thought about it and I- and But you I, don't in your house. Yes, yep. So. <laughs> but it's just like, yeah, exactly. Um, like what are, like what is a tradition? Like so the tradition- Well, like, the tradition is dad's a painter and if you want to expand your company, you get your son to paint with you. Yeah. Is Which, that not the tradition you were thinking of? You, well, I was thinking, so like, well, I was thinking about novel business models, mm -hmm. right? And um, there was the whole like paint zen uproar that happened. I think was it with this, PPG, right? With PPG this past mm -hmm. year, and uh, I don't think they care <laughs> that people are upset. I wouldn't care if I were that. If I were a stockholder, I'd say crush them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I, what was it? I was I was at an insulation uh, training. So mm -hmm. there's a company called IDI Insulation Distributors Inc and their national headquarters in Chanhassen. They're mm -hmm. holding a training. I'm like, I'm gonna go. This will just be very interesting to look at. Yeah. Um, gain some perspective on a new industry, and it's a very, and then a whole energy game is very interesting. Um, and if, if I understood correctly, there are two major players in the installation game. Um, no, there are, three there are three major players, and two of them are very 
novel. Because oh. one of them is a distributor yep. who owns an installer company. Oh, The other is an installer that owns, did I get it right? That owns a distri distribution company? <laughs> but uh, it was basically that PPG, Paint Zen thing, to its fruition. Ex explain in like two sentences what the PPZ Paint Zen thing was. So I think the, disrupt, the uproar about it was that you had a distributor or supplier that was going to also be an installer. Um, so they were actually going to sell paint jobs and get paint jobs Yes, yeah, so they were going to both be selling the product and selling the service. Mm -hmm. And uh, But they sell, so they're selling their competition. It's kind of the big uproar. And I, I might be pushing it, and someone from, from Paint Zen might say, well, the paradigm of what we're doing really is something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's the way that I understood it, is that they were kind of, it was that, not a conflict of interest, but... Um, the marketplace reacted at least on social media, which is at least verbally. At least verbally, and saying, "Oh, let's all cancel our PPG accounts because mm -hmm. we don't want to compete against them. Because if you're truly if you get price conscious, then they're gonna, you know, they, they they can sell their paint at cost to them or at a slight loss. Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> um, because the software company and software companies are valued not on anything tangible. So mm -hmm. if you can boost the value of that, then it'll overcome any tangible losses. That's true. So. That's why I understood it to be, and it just was very interesting to see that happen has happened in other industries already, and um, you know, something like that continue to march forward. And I don't, I'm not, you know, does Benjamin Moore, does Sherwin Williams, uh, take an interest in something like that, or, you know, they would if it was beneficial to their stock price. Or then, some. or then, are they bumping into that whole franchise model where the software is top notch, the processes are there, the marketing is good, but still, some human has to stand in somebody's house. And do this super variable work. Hmm. That's a really good thought. Yeah, it's, and you never want to say absolutely. No, but no, it no. has seemed so far like it's been tough for someone to. So what is it? What is it that makes someone dominate an area, right? So you look at some of the largest residential repaint companies. I would say are more successful. I mean, we're. Like even us, like we're larger than several of like the top franchises combined in mm -hmm. our metro area, uh, like single franchisees. Mm -hmm. And so, why is that? And I'm thinking of like the classic like out east Nolan painting. Oh yeah. Or you go to the like, monsters, the the big the guys. the Albright painting of the mm -hmm. West Coast. Mm -hmm. um, they kind of they dominate more than a franchise does. Yeah. Which is interesting. Yeah. And why is that? And, and is, is it, it because there's one odd and have leader? They, yeah. And do they do it? I was going to say, do they do it after uh, a leadership change? Have they transitioned that out of whether it's the owner-operator or the son or the second, third generation? I mean, there's there's a generation, and it's usually the first one, that grows it to where yes. they dominate. Yep. And uh, when that person leaves, do they still dominate more than uh, other companies oh, with normal so systems? And that would be a good experiment then because is it is it the business that they set up or is it the – specific characteristics of one entrepreneur yeah. that's at the helm that how do you yeah and these are like probably basic things that people are like so but like how do you transfer culture yeah right? so like yeah. culture culture eats execution for breakfast when execution doesn't execute is what i would say right? i love kind of like love that, that. that saying like hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard right? exactly. otherwise talent is going to squash hard work Abs every time if talent works hard like just those things are so good. Just man. get Shaq into the middle school, just <laughs> exactly. blocking shots, yeah. right? But right, if you've got uh, so culture will beat execution yep. when execution doesn't execute, mm -hmm. right? Or wait, I don't know what it was. So what what I keep coming back to, and I don't know when if culture this is, executes. I don't know if this is a um, this is a sort of hypothesis I have, but I don't know if it's useful. I keep going back to why isn't there a Starbucks of painting? Why doesn't while one day painting have a franchise in every major market and basically just scoop everybody up and do it mm -hmm. and I keep coming back to the insane variability of our work mm -hmm. Starbucks produces one thing and you come get it mm -hmm. our clients are producing the one thing and we have to adapt to them mm -hmm. the, the clients adapt to Starbucks Starbucks does their research they come out with a white uh, a white espresso and it's like I don't know that any consumer ever wanted that they just they put it out there, and if you like it, you come get it. If not, go somewhere else. We cannot say we're doing Tony Toe bedrooms in flat paint. Come get them, because they'll say, "Well, I don't want that. I want one shade lighter." And then you're like, "Okay, fine, we'll do that." Is 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 the is our industry different because we're different? 
our employees are different, the client is different, and the house is different, basically on every job. Does that variability limit the ability for Starbucks to come in and take over the industry? So it seems like it. I think it'd be fun to think about what will, what needs to change or what could change to flip that. Right. Well, the, the, the easy thing would be you deliver, instead of infinite products to your homeowners, because mm -hmm. that's basically what yeah. we're doing within range, you offer 10 things and then they have to pick. And as long as there's only those 10 things to pick from, you think you could, you could get it into a process and, and streamline everything, yeah, but, but if they have the options. Yeah, yeah, painting is such like a, such like, such like a baby industry still. It seems yes. like, like it's so rudimentary, it's so uh, like Neanderthal. Mm -hmm. Like I'm just thinking through like any kind of, it seems like it's a far ways, ways away from really becoming standardized and systemized to where a conglomerate could really ex out execute the competition. So you think right now it's just, there's too big of a gap between Man, what's happening things now change. and... Things change fast and uh, what would need to change. Mm -hmm. It's fun to think about these things. I think, um, so like with the whole paint and PPG thing, people were talking about the Uberization of the trades. Yes. Right? And painting. Yep. And I think the Uberization, so what is Uber and why does it work? And I think we had this conversation before, but it kind of started, I think Uber became possible. One of the biggest triggers for Uberization of taxis to, to become possible was the advent of GPS, right? So before then, you were a skilled taxi driver, right? There was a yes. threshold that, would, that you need to acquire over a period of time yep. to know your city intimately and know the routes. Um, but then when GPS, so part of, if you need to Uberize a trade, you have to lower the uh, the, the, the time it takes to adopt something to be a masterful, to, to be able to deliver a product competently, yep, yep, right? Yep. And maybe, you know, the, the guy who knows the Boston area in and out is probably always going to outperform someone who's just solely focused using a GPS, but who cares? Consumer preference, yeah, who cares yeah, now? Who cares? <laughs> um, and, and these metaphors are always messy because you, you're like, oh, what about this? And like, and like, Uber is really about connecting the end user to the client, you know, taking out the the taxi company, yeah, right, the yep. business, and all the people that the, were whoever owns the, the people who were driving taxis could still work directly with the client, so it's different in that way. Mm -hmm. But um, if something like that happened in painting, and res residential repaint is such a hard place, and maybe that's what you're getting to is there's yes. so much variability. Now, I think PPG and Paint Sense said we're going to still go after commercial accounts, yeah, and yeah. they're like, because it makes a lot of sense there, right? Um, just like it makes a lot of sense in uh, lawn mowing or yep. lawn care and mm -hmm. in snow removal, like those should totally be Uberized, and I think they are in Canada, like they're starting to be. Um, so if I if I had stock in a um, lawn care company, I'd be a little nervous right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, I do have stock in a painting company, I'm not very nervous right now. Yeah, yeah, um, that is true. So food for thought, great, kind of fireside chat things. Um, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know where it goes. I guess in, will, will the variability of our industry slow down or limit the Starbucksification of our industry? Will it always be, right now 80% of our industry is one and a half person companies and they're probably not having websites, they're probably not okay. using technology. Well, because of this, like if it was easy, I assume somebody would have done it or maybe that's an ignorant thing to think. Um, will, will there always be, in an industry where 90% of all coffee shops were mom and pop and now 10% are, Will it always be 50-50? Will it always be the 50% one-person companies, time and eternal, and 50% people who do this? You know what I mean? It's just because the nature of the variability, What? That's, that, that's, that's a thought I've had. I don't know where to go with it. I don't know if it's right or wrong or... Well, we did say we expect things to be much different 10 years from now. Yeah. And so... But much different could go from 80% of one-person company just to 50%. And that would be a, that would be a shift. That'd be a huge and, shift. Um, you know, once that happens, then I don't know. You think about coffee shops, right? They're still the the cute coffee shops. But another thing, like the like the general store, like those really get stomped out by Walmart's, right? So you have a, oh, you yeah. have like a general store. It's like yeah, people, you know, consumer preference. You know, some people are always gonna like the little hokey pokey general yeah. store. But they're still magically those people are still spending a lot of money at Walmart, though. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So it's um. Yeah. They, and they go out of business a lot is what I'm trying yeah. to say like yeah. the, so but then with coffee shops okay um, with coffee shops they're a little bit more novel so people 
I think it would be really so. It'd be fun to be. If I look ten years out, I would love to be a conglomerate painting company um, who also owns and has stakes in like the mom and pop deal painting companies, mm -hmm. right? So I think if you're truly trying to win, you almost try and be both. Because I don't, I don't think painting is like general stores where Walmart can truly crush a general store in mm -hmm. an area, right? I think it's more like a coffee shop where you can have your Starbucks and across the street you can have you know, the jo one JoJo's Cafe yep. and they both exist almost synergistically. Um, that's my thought on it. I don't think it's going to be an all or nothing. Interesting. But I do, I do where, think it's going to trend more towards this market does need to be, it feels like the market does need to be consolidated and it will be to an extent, but not to a dominating extent. Yeah, not as not as far as other industries maybe have. So yeah, I don't know. I think yeah, I think we probably share a similar view on that sort of thing. But I'm just curious how the variability limits or makes our industry different in some way. Or maybe I'm just being ignorant and saying yeah. there is a cure for variability. I just haven't come up with it yet. <laughs> yeah, you think your industry is really variable until you meet another industry oh, yeah. that's more variable, <laughs> and they've actually gone through what you're saying will never happen. That would be an interesting thing to find that the the places are like, there's no way you can standardize this. And Somebody standardized this and they did it. That would be an interesting thing. Yeah. Research on our end, maybe. Yeah. So, all right. Let me just make sure we have any other uh, comments here, uh, Peter. All systemization of the painting industry uh, sells. A, oh, are the? Oh, I think we got some. Uh, so the variability is the color on the walls. Yeah, maybe I don't understand. Yeah, sorry. Uh, well, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's always going to be variability there. Um, John. Uh, managing the expectation of customers is a bigger var variability than the colors on the wall. I would say both probably go hand in hand too. Um, yeah, I think we can control the expectations a heck of a lot better than we can control the variable of substrate, paint, finish, application, weather, <laughs> type of house, how much prep, things like that. So, all right, I have taken up enough time of Jason Paris. This has been awesome. Uh, <laughs> nobody's going to be disappointed everybody loves jason paris especially when he's on this show and we can talk freely about this stuff uh you know we're historically we haven't got into a lot of what kind of primer do we use we're here for some higher thought kind of stuff like this is this is this has been really good so and putting this list together uh we will touch on this again if jason will have me back so uh thank you to everybody uh any any final thoughts before we hit the road yeah this is good it's always fun to have you over um to see, in, to see in what you are doing here and what you and your team are building is really inspirational. So yeah. thank you. Well, I always say, if you want to be impressed, come back in six months. Yeah. I said that six months ago. Yeah, Any and I would, I would even say three months at this point, right? <laughs> so, I mean, cool. this is like, uh, uh, seriously, I am, uh, just like in college, there was this little um, coffee shop guy, you know, the one off the mom and pop, yeah. horrible name, horrible logo, non-standardized thing, but he had... You know, he was there. And I asked him, like, listen, man, what happens when Starbucks come in? Like, you you must be scared of that. He's like, that would be the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. Is there's a Starbucks sign on the highway. Starbucks goes right next to me. I would probably double my sales yep. in a year yep. just because of that. You are my Starbucks. <laughs> and over the last year or two, from, from knowing you and what you're building here, to have, I'm not even going to call you a competitor because we believe in the cooperation. Mm -hmm. To have somebody operating in my space of your caliber has really probably made a definite impact about what I'm doing too. So, and it's, and it's easy to kind of follow, follow the model, you know, it's been really fun. So, uh, I will personally thank you. And I know the industry, if you haven't thanked you already, probably will in the next little while. So just know that, um, you guys know what you're doing is impressive, but remember, there's a lot of people who are sort of looking to this for this. We feel there's a Renaissance yeah. that there's this change and to see somebody like, yeah, we're the change. Like yeah. this is this is it. It's it's good. So thank you. Yeah. I don't mean to I don't mean to make you feel uh 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 yeah That's uncomfortable Minas or yeah, anything. Minnesotans so. are very. It's a hard for us to accept. You, you understand how difficult it was for me to just say that. <laughs> <laughs> all I wanted to do is stare at your shoes and not say that. Yeah. So all right. So thanks everybody. Thanks for watching again. Kindest thing you can do is to like this, uh, like the page, and share it. And uh, yeah, this is this is the highest realization of the Ask a Painter show. This is what we wanted to do. So. Thank you for allowing me to not talk about paint for a little bit and talk about the business of paint. So everybody have a good weekend. Thanks to Jason Paris and the crew. We'll see you later.